if there's one common denominator that's making it very, very hard out here to help people at all levels, it's not any specific group of people, it is the growing destroyer of society, the growing destroyer of individuals, the growing destroyer of every institution by year by year by year I personally can see this becoming a much bigger and much more destructive problem that will probably eventually um, it'll cause a demise of our country and that is entitlement Entitlement by definition is a belief that one is deserving of or entitled to certain privileges and signs of a person who is entitled, just to clear that up a little bit, are they think the rules don't apply to them, they're self-absorbed, they're self-obsessed, they are focused on their needs and not the needs of others, they're argumentative, they go out of their way to serve themselves they feel as if they deserve better they have an exaggerated sense of self-worth they feel as though they deserve special treatment in all places that they go whether it's a restaurant or a church or they just feel they deserve special attention they are better than others in how they think and how they act and they also know more than others they will not admit to their mistakes because they rarely see them. They don't listen to other people. It's often a my way or the highway mentality that you either come along with them or they don't have any need for you. And I have never seen anything like the progressive state of this attitude lately, even in the sense what has happened since COVID with, I don't know how people can afford to live and not work, but plenty are doing that. And I can't even tell you what happens inside my brain when I hear the words, why would I work when I can make more money not working on unemployment? It uh, just twists my brain into a knot because I think in what, in what, way does that ever make you a better person in what possible way could that ever grow your character or make you a better person there is not one benefit to that type of thinking and i hear this kind of thing a lot and often it is similar at a lesser level of why would i pay for my food myself when I can work less hours and qualify for full benefits, which would be generally $200 a month in food stamps, why would I work when I can get it for free? Why would I get help with my addiction now when I'm getting a motel room paid for as a homeless person and all my needs are covered as well. So I realize that most of my family members have beautiful homes and I can stay there. But if I say that I'm homeless, then I get set up in swanky housing and I get all my bills paid. And my student loans are pushed out and out and out. I'll wait until all the benefits run out and the money runs out and everything stops coming to me. And then I will consider if I am willing to get help for whatever it is that makes me okay with living like this. Why would I ever go to work when I can qualify for free housing, free insurance, free food, because I say I have an addiction or I have a mental illness. And I have listened to numerous times as people told me from all my years of working in jails and treatment how they coached others into what exactly to say to qualify for the funding that then pays your rent and your expenses from then on if you qualify as disabled by the way that they coach you to say 
different phrases, which I won't say, but they say if you say these specific phrases, then you can qualify for funding that will make you never have to step up and be a one who earns your own wage. And that's just a tip of the iceberg. That is a tip of the iceberg. Many don't live off government funding as much as they feel entitled to live off their parents when they're 28, 30 something, and they're still living at home and just offended when they're asked to pay rent, to chip in on food. They become angry. They become combative with parents who they feel owe them a living still. They want money from them still. They, they live in expectation of their inheritance. When were we ever deserving of any of those things? And yet, these people contact us all the time and they say, I feel empty, I feel bored. I want to know what my purpose and my calling is. And I start with what are they doing now? And they go into all these things and all the time that they have to get involved in their purpose because they don't have to work. And it's just mind boggling that they don't see a connection between helping others, but yet they themselves are completely living off of someone else. And they are enough able-bodied and able-minded to be taking care of many themselves. The more that someone makes this thing called life about themselves, the more disappointed, dry, and weary they're going to become. And the more they understand that this life is about Jesus, his kingdom, his crown, his glory, and how we can serve his kingdom, the more freed up we are going to be to celebrate God's moving wherever he's going to be moving, which is God is moving all the time. And he is not going to accept into that moving people who feel entitled to anything except hell. That's the only entitlement he will accept because that is what we are entitled to. Jack Chambliss is a professor of economics at Valencia College, and every year he starts his class off by asking his students to write a 10-minute essay on what the American dream looks like to them and what they want the federal government to do to help them achieve their dream. And he describes the most recent results as about 10% of the students said they wanted the government to leave them alone not tax them too much and let them regulate their own lives. But over 80% of the students said that the American dream to them meant a house, a job, plenty of money for retirement, plenty of money for vacations, and benefits of looking rich. But when it comes to the part about the federal government, eight out of 10 students said that they wanted free health care, they wanted the government to pay for their tuition, they want the government to pay the down payment on their house. They expect the government to give them a job. And many of them said they wanted the government to tax the wealthy so that they could have an opportunity at a better life. So that's how they see themselves getting all of those things, is at the hand of the government, taking it from someone else and giving it to them, which can tell you why there's a certain push that has gained such momentum in our society, in our in our country's government a certain way because people really feel that they don't have to work for what others have, that those others should hand it to them and they rightfully deserve it. So you can see why there's so much speed developing because of the mentality of entitlement, which no longer sees the value of working to um, to support your own self and your own life. They see it as owed to me. And our whole society has developed this mentality, particularly the young, but anyone can be guilty of thinking this because that they exist, they're entitled to certain things. And this mentality is contrary 
to the characteristics that we are to have as God's people. They oppose them. They are directly contradicting what a Christ follower is, which is a contentment in what God has provided, a submission to God, which is to submit to him rather than to seek our own will, our own pleasures, our own desires. All of it is linked to him. And if we will consider some of the things that many believe that they're entitled to today and contrast them against the Bible, we're definitely going to see the truth between the entitlement people and those who are actually disciples of Christ. They cannot be the same people. For many, whatever makes them happy is what they believe they are allowed to do. Example, social drinking, premarital sex, these things people feel entitled to, not recognizing they are not permitted. These pleasures in life are not permitted as a follower of Jesus. We are to consider others more than ourselves. Yet our lives should not be about whatever makes us happy. We're called to deny self, Luke 9, 23. Our first priority in life is to please the Lord, Colossians 1, 10. Our second priority is to love others many references Romans 1 Romans 15 1 through 3 Philippians 2 3 through 8 we are not entitled to acceptance as many believe they are entitled to do whatever makes them happy they also believe they're entitled to the acceptance of others if they have some sin they cannot control they think that everyone should just bear with them they cannot stop this certain thing they demand upon um, respect and they still think that they should be given the freedom to roam around your house unattended even though everything keeps disappearing they're offended when you say I don't want you in my house anymore they feel entitled to be at your house if you do what is wrong you have no entitlement to the acceptance of the righteous Ephesians 5 11 meaning you should not expect it. If you do what is right, you should not expect that the world is going to accept you. John 15, 18 through 19. We are not entitled to a certain standard of living that could include income, type of job, level of education, quality of health care. Many see these as entitlements. Others see them as purely political issues. And this is also a biblical issue. We are simply not entitled to these things, according to the Bible. We are to be content with whatever we have. Philippians 4, 11 through 12. In fact, in this country, the United States, we aren't even entitled to our life. We are alive because our mother chose to give birth to us. But if she had not felt like doing that, we were not entitled to our life either. Couldn't, wouldn't, had no rights to our own life. Through hard work, we may improve our lot in life, Proverbs 12, 24, but we must do so within the context of serving Christ, Colossians 3, 23. We are also not entitled to the possessions of others, and this is tied to a previous point again that many see as political, but it is not a political issue. Many believe they're entitled to a certain standard of living, therefore they believe they're entitled to take from others to get it. They fully believe that they can do that. The Bible teaches that each one has a right to his own possessions. And of course, those who have been richly blessed ought to share with those in need. But this is done out of goodwill and their free choice. We are not entitled to take from others to help ourselves. We are not entitled to marry whoever we want either. People believe they're entitled to marry whoever they want. But that is not true. God commands us to be equally yoked. And equally yoked means with him. That we are of the same, of the same with him. The biggest and most disagreements in life will come from that not being the case. Children are destroyed. God created the institution of marriage. Therefore, he makes the rules about marriage, not us. And he set it up how it was supposed to be. We are not entitled to our own interpretation of truth. Everyone wants to believe what seems right to them, but the Bible says in Proverbs 14, 12, that this way leads to death. And God's word is the truth, and we must accept it. If we are a follower of Christ, we accept it.
There's no other option. We are to rightly divide the word according to 2 Timothy 2.15. We are not to twist it to our own destruction, 2 Peter 3.16. And the entitlement mentality is dangerous. It's a threat to contentment. It's a subtle beginning to a rebellion against God. We need to be content with all the good things that he's given us, and we need to see the good things that he's given us. We must submit to God's will, and we must not pursue our own will. Economics professor Thomas Sowell was interviewed recently on Fox News, and he said, I see no long-term good coming from this entitlement mentality. It destroys initiative, independence, inventiveness, resourcefulness, motivation, the fear of consequences, and the link between cause and effect. It promotes indulgence, jealousy, conceit, laziness, and self-centeredness. It creates bad winners and bad losers. It hurts marriages by putting the focus on what can I get from him or her rather than what can I give to him or her. It hurts charity because the rich leave it to the government and the and withdraw from contact with the poor, and the poor just get handouts from an impersonal, faceless, soulless state rather than from real caring people. Above all, a sense of entitlement destroys the Christian life. And as a Christian, there is one entitlement for sure, only one that I know of. I am entitled to hell for eternity. That's the only entitlement that I know that I have. That's all I deserve. Because of my sin, that's all I deserve. And anything else is grace, unmerited bonus from God, all grace for me. I don't deserve a breath of life, a crumb of food, a drop of water, one thread of clothing, one penny in a wallet, or one hour of further education. I'm not entitled to one friend, one vacation, one Bible verse, or even one sermon. I'm entitled to hell, not salvation, not heaven. I'm entitled to damnation and hell. That's what I'm entitled to. And I think that knowing that and not having any confusion about that has saved me from a ton of distractions, anxiety, and issues. I have plenty. But that alone, just knowing that, has saved me so many things. And I'm just so fortunate that I grew up in a farming community in the middle of the country, way out in the middle of nowhere, where farming livestock and crops was what gave us our living. So working constantly on a farm was not a question of if it was get up and what time and then you just worked you didn't get to slag you had no option of sloth and you didn't even get a chance to be sick it was the work is here it needs to get done and it needs to get done today that's the best thing that ever happened to me because if I would have run into this you can easily not work, not this, not that. You can grow up this way with all these benefits, all the latest electronics, but yet not pay for anything. I, I, I regret how much I know I would have fallen into that because I didn't have good character. So I'm really grateful that I wasn't aware and that I was raised different to know that you work I don't care how sick you are. I don't care how screwed up you are. You work. You work. You don't take from others. And that's that was just the only truth I knew. So there's two ways to make life work. One is with a proud and angry sense of entitlement. Or second way with a humble and thankful sense of responsibility. And... To summarize, the Bible speaks to that. It says in Romans 6.23, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We deserve death. The twelve apostles of Jesus Christ, these were the men chosen to be the inner circle, the intimate friends of Jesus, the Son of God who left heaven, came to earth, lived for 33 years until he was murdered, 
But these were the men he chose as his inner circle. And this is how they all ended their lives. This is a list of how their lives ended on this earth. After suffering greatly for their faith on account of being bold witnesses because they walked with Jesus, so their lives were full of suffering and beatings, but here is how they died. Peter and Paul were both martyred in Rome around 66 AD. During the persecution under Emperor Nero, Paul was beheaded. Peter was crucified upside down at his own request because he did not feel worthy to die in the same manner as Jesus. Andrew went to the land of the man-eaters in what is now known as the Soviet Union, where Christians there claim him as the first to bring the gospel to their land. He also preached in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, and in Greece, where it is said he was crucified. Doubting Thomas was probably the most active in the area east of Syria. Tradition has him preaching as far east as India, where the ancient Marthoma Christians revered him as their founder. They claim that he died there when pierced through with the spears of four soldiers. Philip possibly had a powerful ministry in Carthage in North Africa and then in Asia Minor, where he converted the wife of a Roman proconsul. In retaliation, the proconsul had Philip arrested and cruelly put to death. Matthew, the tax collector and writer of a gospel, ministered in Persia and Ethiopia. Some of the oldest reports say he was not martyred, while others say he was stabbed to death in Ethiopia. Bartholomew had widespread missionary travels attributed to him by tradition to India with Thomas, back to Armenia, also to Ethiopia and southern Arabia. There are various accounts how he he met his death as a martyr for the gospel. James, the son of Alphaeus, is one of the least three James referred to in the New Testament. There are some confusion as to which is which, but this James is reckoned to have ministered in Syria. The Jewish historian Josephus reported that he was stoned and then clubbed to death. Simon the Zealot ministered in Persia and was killed after refusing to sacrifice to the sun god. Matthias was the apostle chosen to replace Judas. He was sent to Syria with Andrew and to death by burning. John was the only one of the company generally thought to have died a natural death from old age. He was the leader of the church in the Ephesus area and is said to have taken care of Mary, the mother of Jesus, in his home. And during Domitian's persecution in the middle 90s, he was exiled to the island of Patmos, there he is credited with writing the last book of the New Testament, the Revelation. In early Latin tradition, it has him escaping unhurt after being cast into boiling oil in Rome. Those are the closest friends of Jesus on earth, far from perfect men, but that was how they lived out their lives after meeting Jesus and after understanding what was expected of those who choose to follow Jesus. And Jesus explained for the third time in detail how he was going to die to these disciples. And he said, the son of man would be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. The priests and teachers would condemn him to death, hand him over to the Gentiles who would mock him, spit on him, flog him and kill him. And three days later he would rise. And being on this side of the crucifixion and the resurrection, we read this and recognize Jesus had perfectly described the situation right down to the spitting. And the third day resurrection detail is spelled out very clearly. And none of the words Jesus spoke were in any literary structure or hidden in any poetic language. Jesus said it exactly how it happened. He communicated exactly how he was going to die before it happened. The message was communicated clearly, but the men did not get it. How many people do we know who have been attending church their entire lives? They've heard the messages over and over and over again. 
The truth has been spoken to them over and over and over again. What it means to be saved from sin, who Jesus really is, what it means to be an actual real Christian, and yet they have done nothing differently in their lives to demonstrate that they comprehend what is being preached. So Jesus said it to his disciples. They didn't understand that he was actually going to be killed here. But it's going on today where the truth is being proclaimed and people continue to live as if they are not going to meet God and answer for every day and every word that they have had. There's a spiritual block somewhere. And in the case of the disciples, it took the murder of Jesus on the cross right in front of them and the extreme sorrow that they felt as a result that they had ignored everything he had said to that point to remove that block. And in the case of us today, many, it often takes something similar where we must be rocked completely out of our almost sanity to come to uh, any kind of a desire to actually believe what is true about Jesus. And there needs to be a severe amount of sorrow or pain that will shake us open to our spiritual state so many have active lives proclaiming the gospel, they say, but the representation brings no conviction to many people around them. Sin is, is so tolerated in the church and amongst those of the faith. And my prayer has always been that more don't have to die for this to become real to people. I mean, people all around us are dying, but yet people are so self-focused that they, they just pick up and move on the next day. They, they rarely stay in mourning or loss, the person is soon forgotten, except for when it comes up in memories. I still suffer trauma from tragic deaths of close friends. There's always more. This is the most deadly it's ever been. I'm glad that I can be impacted by that because there was a day when I wasn't. I, I certainly did not like having people die around me, but I could move on fairly quickly. It motivates me to this day to try, try to help save lives if I can, mostly because so many are under the impression that they can live according to their own desires, whether that be religiously doing what they think is a good idea for God or who live straight out sinful lives where they live for pleasure. It doesn't matter if you are not seeking God for the direction of your life and the steps that you're taking. It doesn't matter how religious you are. It doesn't matter how high up in religion you are. If you cannot hear from God and follow his voice, you are not ready to meet him. And I just pray that something shakes more people into reality before they don't have a chance because they will be standing in front of him without having had a relationship with him. Two of the disciples asked Jesus if they could sit on either side of his throne in his glory. They thought his glory would be here on earth when he overthrew the Romans and set up his kingdom. They didn't listen to him say, I'm going to be murdered here. But this is very similar to our country. Do whatever it takes to get ahead. And unfortunately, I think too often, this means at the, on the backs of other people. And whether it means financially, socially, the corporate ladder or whatever ladder, there's many ladders. This happens in our workplace, in our families. And unfortunately, it is happening in most churches and ministries even more than the other places. And in our spiritual lives, there's a sense of entitlement that leads us to be lazy in the faith. Like we can just believe and not be out doing the things that God said we would be doing if we were truly his. We really feel that belief 
and living a clean life, not addicted and crazy like some other people, is going to meet that standard, and it will not. We want a relationship with God that doesn't require work from us. We want to read our devotions, get them emailed to us so we don't have to actually sit and find something in a Bible. We want intimacy with God, but we don't want to have to put in the effort. We want to save our effort for when I get to work and I'm really working to build up the college fund or the income, my efforts are for this life here, not the kingdom. And as much as people are feuding in this day over we have two desires for our country, we have those who want one thing, those who want another, and it's difficult how many who profess to be of the same belief as, as myself that they are feeling like the economy is something that God prioritizes and would want us to have. They are feeling like the blessings of God are material and are being stolen. There's some kind of a disconnect between God's people and that it would be the mercy of God to bring down the economy so that people would stop living for it and stop worshiping it and stop counting on it. That they would shift that focus to himself so that they could be saved. Because many are delusional to think that we are owed any of those things and it has replaced God in our lives. I don't care what you call yourself or if you had some crazy amazing experience with him. If money sustains your life and you count on that, God is not the God of your life. Money is. In Joshua's day, the people wanted God's blessing without doing what God commanded. And we must never think that we can receive God's blessings if we ignore the means by which he has ordained it for us to obtain them. People want the blessing without the sense of obligation. And true discipleship involves very real and very deep change. Paul warned Timothy, there will come terrible times in the last days. People's will, people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, followed by have nothing to do with them. That's God's instruction to us about people who have those characteristics. I'm going to read them again. Lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. He says, do have nothing to do with them. That's what God says. The Christian community is certainly not immune to this problem. But the thing is, there are those who are followers of Jesus and a very large group who are not, who think that they are. Because somehow in some church or some preacher has sanctioned that they can live for themselves, be prosperous, have all nice things, expect that, and be a follower, a disciple of Jesus. If Jesus blesses you, he's intending to give through you, not to you, because we are stewards here. So if he can't give through you and you're storing it up for yourself, you, were, you have completely missed the point of him giving to you. You will answer for everything you stored up too. There are large segments of Christian teaching that tell us that God wants us to be rich, healthy, and successful according to the world's standards. 
but that is not at all what God meant for prosperity. And as a result, we have many who claim to be Christian, who believe that they're entitled to new, nice, snazzy cars, a big home, and all the other things that the world calls success. We're told we need to step out in faith and expect God to provide. We're even told to expect a miracle, which leads inevitably to the idea of demanding a miracle. This is spiritual entitlement, and it is very offensive to God. God does bless people. There is no doubt about it. He has even blessed many with prosperity and power. He does do miracles. However, there are people all around the world who are more faithful than we are, and yet materially they have nothing, and they count themselves to be the most blessed. And there are people who endure great physical trials, yet they possess a faith that is deeper than anything any of us will ever understand. These people do not feel entitled to worldly blessings. They have discovered the blessing of intimacy with God, which is far more dear to them than anything the world could possibly give them. And somehow we seem to have come to believe that we deserve God's blessing or that he owes us something. Especially if we say that we're his, then he really owes us something. If God doesn't deliver, then we seem to feel he's let us down. That is foolishness. It is, I, it's not even, it, a believer, a true believer in Christ could not even, that is not part of the thinking of a believer. The Bible gives us a different picture of our situation, a very clear one, because Jesus is clear in his communication. We are told that we are people who have fallen short of God's standard of perfection. The doctrine of the sinfulness of man is one doctrine that we can verify simply by looking around us. God has given us a gift we do not deserve. He has extended forgiveness and we did not earn it. He does not owe us anything. We owe him everything. Jesus did not call us to demand any rights. He, in fact, taught that we should be willing to surrender all of our personal rights for the sake of the gospel. He did. He surrendered far more than we will ever have to. Jesus didn't teach us to gather things. He told us to give it away to help other people. He didn't teach us to demand from others. He taught us to give of ourselves to others, all. He taught us that joy does not come from material things and accumulating and status and power. Joy comes from resting in him and having a clean conscience before him. And in truth, even the persistent disregard for the word of God is due largely to the sense of entitlement. People feel entitled to interpret the Bible any which way they want to interpret it. They believe they're entitled to fashion their own belief system, to draw their own Jesus, to say what God's word means today versus when it was written. We decide what God will allow in our life because he knows our heart. And I hear that all the time. God knows my heart. But the problem is God does know our heart and he says it's wicked. It's deceitful and it's wicked. He does know our heart. And quite often the results of people seeking to get ahead of others creates what the 10 disciples felt, indignation and resentfulness. But we should not confuse getting ahead with having ambition because Jesus had ambition. You can see that his followers his disciples that went on after his ascension, they had ambition. They went to different countries, just mere men back then, pre any crazy technology, to actually bring the gospel to foreign lands. That was the men who immediately served around him. They captured his ambition. His ambition was to lay down his life for others. He had purpose. He was sent down from heaven as the only begotten son of God, not to claim greatness. He could have stood and said, I'm the creator. I'm the healer. I'm the miracle worker. I'm the teacher. He was all of those things, but he was sent down to give up his life in service to those who were much lower than him. In fact, he had just explained this ambition in detail before 
they requested to sit at the right and the left hand of him. He had just said all that. Jesus now had to call the 12 disciples together, calm down their emotions. Each of the disciples thought they knew what was the best place in God's kingdom and that they thought they deserved the best place. God got them together to explain the differences between the world's view of greatness and his view of greatness. And again, he turns everything upside down. Jesus explained that the world's rulers exercise their authority by lording over those who are under them. Their method of management was to use their power and authority to control those under them to make them do whatever they want done. And those underneath are supposed to serve those who are in power. That was what having power was all about. However, when it comes to God's kingdom, Jesus' words were, Whoever wants to become great among you must be a servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. So you can see that doesn't fit any modern leadership. There's leadership conferences all the time amongst Christians, but he never taught us to lead the way that we're taught to lead. He said, serve, be a slave. That's what Jesus said is leading. And then as the leader of the group, he points his finger at himself and said, for, the, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. He explained what God's kingdom was, and it's polar opposite to somehow how we've gotten it, where people send long lists ahead to the the guest ministers of their what do you need there all their list of what I want how we have positioned people into um, titles and and roles and salaries and callings and elevated them up above other people is mind-boggling because the Bible speaks very much against that it's very against that. So here's people who are teaching you the Bible who haven't even either read the Bible or they certainly haven't understood the Bible. But if they did understand the Bible and they were representing a leader or a voice for Jesus, they would say, be like Jesus, be a servant, expect nothing, serve others, especially the lowliest. And if we're honest with ourselves, we distance ourselves from being, being servants because everything in life has taught us not to. It's humiliating, embarrassing, certainly not a high call. But God says, that's the high call. We often discover we have so much going on in our own lives, work, our own needs, kids in sports, all this stuff. We don't see any possibility of how we can get out and serve because we don't have time to be a servant. We figure we're serving all these different ways in, we're in the church, we serve our family, but see God was clear about how he wants us to serve and in a kingdom way. Not, it's automatic if you make a family that you serve your family, but that's not the same as a kingdom service. We're called to be Christ-like, and to be like Christ means to be a servant of all. That's what it is. And not only that, but being Christ-like means serving without expected, without any expectation of accolades, praise, honor, or being called anything in a high position. You expect nothing. You don't need any long list of what you're great at. To Christ, it means serving. For the sake of honoring God. That's it. Honor him, not yourself. And dumbing down the truth of the gospel is destroying the kingdom of God. It is destroying it because it's being dumbed down. People are being taught non-truths. They're being it's being twisted to where they think this group of people have arrived. This group that has just lost their home and someone has died tragically, they are not in God's favor. It's completely backwards of what God says. And lowering God's standards of holiness is uh, really, I would never want to be guilty of doing that when I meet him. 
Redefining or excusing sin can make people like you, but it is definitely not loving. And if they end up going lost because they believed you, what you said to them and you represented God, the blood is on your hands. You have just squandered your own eternity. Such actions hinder a person's intimacy with God. Don't lie to people about what's expected. Be very clear that we are promised suffering. We are promised persecution. Very likely it could be death at this level with the end coming. We could end up being martyred. Who knows? But don't lie to people and say that they're going to be blessed if they come to Jesus. They will be blessed, but not in the way that they are thinking blessing means. It is not prosperity. It is suffering. It makes us closer to Jesus. God's standards are, it also cannot be negotiated. We don't need to make them different because of our how many years ago or our culture or people over there don't live in this kind of rich. Which is there's nothing about his standard that is negotiable. We don't we don't change it according to any kind of earthly system. So how do we combat this rampant mentality? We must understand that there are people who need help, but there are also a lot of people who are lazy and choose laziness. There will always be people who feel that the world owes them something. However, there are times when people really need help and they cannot do it for themselves. We have to figure out who's who. Don't help those who just completely feast off of others to keep going. But the one who desperately needs your help, you can definitely help them. Please be there to help them. We must face facts. Life as we know it is not fair. And some people seem to have it easier than others. God does not treat everyone the same. He raises some up and not others. We don't know why. You're not entitled to what the others were raised up into. God does not owe any one of us anything. And on the contrary, like I said, we owe him everything and we are not a victim. We are not a victim of God. We are not a victim of other people. Well, if you make yourself a victim of either one, you can, but you should not do that. We have to change our work ethic to be a very strong work ethic. And no matter what the job, we work at it with all of our heart as unto the Lord. Work is not a necessary evil. It is our mission field. So if you're looking at life as, I can get money this way, I don't have to go to work, that might have been your mission field. That might have been your calling. That might have led you to your calling and your mission field. We must adjust our focus. We should focus on being like Jesus rather than the successful people all around us who we want to be like. He is our goal, not a $1,000 suit. We should focus on what we can do for others instead of what others can do for us or doing for others that can do something for us. We should focus on helping people to manage on their own rather than simply throwing money at them. It's insane to be in a country where that is prevalent, where it's the more the common than people who actually work. It's going to come to many, many, many have lost. As you can see, this country has lost God. So it's mostly, mostly the demise of a lot of how we were shown what was acceptable and it is not acceptable. We should measure ourselves by the word of God rather than measuring the word of God by our own thoughts and desires. We must trust in God's provision and if we want to avoid being entitled, we should trust God's provision in every aspect of our lives. We should be grateful for what we have and trust that God knows what we need and when we need it. He also knows what will destroy us. And I'm far enough ahead to know that all of the things that I have wanted and most of what I probably asked him for, I can see now how that not, would not have benefited me. It would not have been good for me at the time. It would have derailed me and distracted me from the best. So I do trust him that when it's good for me, that's when I will hopefully be receiving it because I have 
way too many problems to be trusted to always do right with blessings. We may never change the attitude of entitlement that people seem to have, but we must change our own. We can focus on what we have been given by a very, very gracious God instead of what we still have not gotten in this life. We can diligently pursue humility, holiness, and service, and we can learn to be content, and we can learn to be thankful in all things. We can learn to be givers rather than takers. You cannot outgive God. And if we do this, our relationship with God and with others will be so rich, but we will also find our purpose. We will know our purpose. We will not be bored. We will not be um, lonely. All of the things that people want from all these personal inner needs to be met are met by serving. If you want to stay sober, if you want to stay away from your pet sin, start serving. Serving is how I stayed completely out of all the traps that he pulled me out of. Serving. I had nothing else to do. I started serving. And it, to this day, I have not changed. When I get kind of complacent in a role where I'm no longer serving, I cannot wait to get out of it. I must serve for the sake of keeping myself out of my own stinking thinking. I hate it. So I would stress that if you want to be like Jesus, if you want to show up brightly as a true follower of Jesus, if you want to give someone an amazing example of what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus, get out and serve the broken. It says those in jail, widows, Find people that are definitely not having a good experience with life. Come around them and start serving them. Start bringing light and hope into the lives of those who are really lacking. That's how you will be known as an amazing Christian, not for status. Precious Lord, thank you for the Bible. Thank you for leaving us with your thoughts, your truth, knowing that as every year went by, that it would get farther and farther and farther away from what you intended. And that even the church you said in the end would not even represent you. So I ask that you help us to continue to lay down every perk that we feel is owed us. Even having a vehicle is a great blessing. Having heating in our home is such a huge blessing. It is not owed us. We don't deserve cars or homes. Thank you for helping us to fall so low that we knew that. We know that. I ask that you do a radical work in our country. And you shake this country to their senses so that they know this life is a vapor. And be ready for the eternal life, which is not about any of this. Help us, Jesus, to get our eyes on you and not on our own life. I pray for revival in every one of us. I ask you by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would burn out all entitlement, all pride, all of the spirits that hang out with pride. There's so many, rebellion and anger. Jesus, deliver us from ourselves and help us in these last days to populate heaven with all of those who many think they are actually saved. Help us, Jesus, to be about your business. I ask this all in your precious name. Amen.